Are you a JavaScript ninja and want to get into full stack web development? In this video, I will give you a complete roadmap of everything you need to know and learn covering from beginner to advanced levels in a very organized fashion with all the free links to study material in the video description to save you money and time. The only thing I'm asking in return is you smashing the like button and considering subscribing if you find this video helpful. Let's go. By looking at this graph, you can probably tell that being a full stack web developer requires a pretty diverse set of skills. That's why we have so many branches going out our main node. And I called each branch with a corresponding letter. W for web basics, F for frontend, B for backend, D for DevOps, M for miscellaneous, and E for extra stuff that you might want to learn. I'm gonna put timestamps in the video description so that you can skip to the needed section if you want to. But all in all, I would suggest going through everything since that's what the video is about, being a full stack web developer. With that said, we're gonna start off with the web basics first. And for this, we need to go to the very top of our graph and find the web basics. And it has sub children, basically children. And children are colored, as you can see. Each color represents how difficult or how necessary this thing is for you. Green color means that this is absolutely necessary for you to learn in order to qualify for a full stack web developer. And yellow is something that is also absolutely necessary, but is gonna be a bit more challenging than a green color. We're also gonna have red colors in the future. There are no red colors in the web basics, but red color is something that is optional unless you are not a junior full stack web developer and is gonna be more challenging to grasp. But anyway, first off, for web basics, you want to make sure that you know what the OSI model is, especially if you don't have a technical degree. This is something that is necessary and also gonna be interesting for you. You should also know the difference between HTTP and HTTPS, how DNS works, what hosting is, and how assets are basically hosted on the internet in general. You should also probably know the difference between client and server and how each of them function. And of course, mouse click to website paint. I promise this is gonna be really interesting, especially if you're a beginner, basically. This is gonna describe or explain how data will go from your mouse to your router, to your ISP, reach some kind of a server. Server will let you download the assets to your browser and your browser is gonna paint the website. So this is something that I suggest in order to get a general idea of how internet works. If you are a normal internet user, you might not know all of these details and, I, and I'm sure <laughs> you're gonna be surprised. The next big branch that we have here is frontend. And frontend is a discipline on its own, as you know, and is pretty extensive. So the first sub branch in frontend is HTML. And HTML also has green and yellow points. You want to make sure that you know the best practices of HTML, such as semantic HTML, meaning that you don't put divs for <laughs> every kind of element. But for example, if you are working with a navigation, then you have a nav. If you are having a form, you use the form element and not the div. You also want to know how form validation works because mostly we have forms everywhere where the user input is needed and something a bit more difficult to understand, well, not to understand, but to <laughs> implement could be accessibility, which is absolutely necessary nowadays and SEO. These are a bit more advanced topics, but all in all, those are related to HTML and will be will come in handy in the future. Next up, we have CSS. As you know, CSS goes hand in hand with, with HTML. And here you, we also have best practices because CSS can be quite a headache for some of us and if we know the best practices, we can utilize the CSS for our advantage 100%. We also should know what media queries is and how to make websites responsive, because if you are building a website for your customer and they use the website on their phone and see that it's not responsive, that's something they're not gonna like. Since a lot of internet users are nowadays using mobiles, responsiveness 
is even more important. With CSS, we have a lot of edge cases and exceptions. And this is what I meant when I said you could have headache. And <laughs> to avoid that headache, you should get familiar. You should be familiar with what kind of edge cases and exceptions CSS has. For example, what the box model is or why positioning absolutely makes your element disappear if you haven't specified the top, bottom, left or right values and so on. Architecture wise, we also have two ways to use CSS and HTML together, which is BAM and object oriented CSS. This is again, something advanced. You don't have to jump into it as a first thing. We also have design systems. You probably definitely heard about Bootstrap. We have a lot of alternatives on the market like materialized CSS, Tailwind, which is quite popular at the moment. But I would suggest learning just one of them because it's going to take you maybe an hour or two hours to be fami familiar with all of them. And actually, since they are C basically class based, you literally add a class to your HTML and everything works. There isn't much to learn. You just need to know that these things exist. Next up, we have preprocessors and preprocessors make our life easy when working with CSS. For example, using SAS will let you nest your CSS selectors, which is super nice. There's also another alternative less, but it's barely used. So I wouldn't really recommend recommend learning it or even looking into it. Next up with in yellow colors, we have CSS modules, which is something new, which means you can use JavaScript to define your CSS. It is extensively used in frameworks, for example, in react, also style components, something again related to modern frameworks. And of course, animation, especially how to make them performant, because there are a lot of ways to do animations with CSS. For example, if you want to move an element, you can play around with well transitions and width and height. But you should know that using width and height or changing width and height is not performant at all because it triggers a lot of calculations in the CSS, but rather you should use translations and so on. Again, I'm going to put a lot of links in the description that you should check in order to be familiar with all of these topics. Next up, we have a JavaScript here and JavaScript again has subchildren with basics. I just listed the main thing, things that came into my mind. So you got to make sure that you know what scopes, closures, hosting is in JavaScript. These are kind of the basics. Ajax uh, will let you know how data is transferred dynamically and um, you can you, how you make requests to the servers and other places. Dom manipulation is something again, really important event listeners, a big part of JavaScript and again, Dom manipulation, they go hand in hand. And of course, inheritance is a big part of JavaScript again, because JavaScript is a multi paradigm language and inheritance is everywhere, especially in frameworks and libraries such as react and angular, the whole structure of a component of an angular component, for example, and in react is based around inheritance. Knowing this is super important if you want to go further into frameworks. In frameworks, we have react. And basically, I put all of the frameworks in green, but not because they're easy to learn, but because they are they're very important to learn, you should choose maybe one framework from this list. And don't dive deep into all of the frameworks. For example, choose react, but you should take a course or core two, or maybe watch some videos on other frameworks as well. Because let's say you change your job. And the new company uses a different framework. I'm sure you will, you will definitely be able to learn this new framework in a weekend, because as soon as you know the basics of JavaScript, learning frameworks is pretty easy, but you should still have an idea how it works and how the structure of the framework looks like. For example, I use Angular at work, but I still looked into React, Vue and Svelte at the same time. So if somebody asks me to write a Vue application, I will have a really easy time using Vue because I already know how it works, even though I have not used it in production. Next up, we have state management, which is again, very related to frameworks that we have. 
And yes, you can use state management without any frameworks, but frameworks nowadays usually are used together with state management. In case of Redux, it's a very popular state management for React. Vuex is gonna be for Vue, NGRX store for Angular, and Context API is used for Vue.js. If you pick one of these libraries or frameworks that I listed above, you should probably learn the corresponding state management as well. And going further, as you can see, as I promised, the red elements or red color. This means this is pretty difficult or, well, it's something extra that you need to be a pro and it's not needed if you're a, a very beginner, but it's also pretty cool to know to be maybe a middle or uh, a senior developer. So know what Shadow, Shadow DOM is because it's used basically under the hood of React. Know how custom elements work because it's kind of a new way of building things on the web and what HTML templates is because this is also is used under the hood of all of the all of the frameworks pretty much. Next up we have TypeScript. Any developer that I know who uses JavaScript also uses TypeScript at the same time. So I would say this is very important to know as well. Next we have package managers such as NPM. I would suggest learning what basic commands NPM has and what it can do and how a uh, package JSON works and so on. And you're gonna be good to go because a lot of people don't know, but NPM is super flexible. You don't have to learn, you're, uh, learn yarn. It's basically very similar. So just go with NPM. Well, I would say that was it with JavaScript, but still we have a lot of things in the front end section. Next up, we have fonts. Fonts are, well, you might think that fonts are really a really simple concept, but no. Fonts take up a lot of memory in apps and websites, so a lot of megabytes, and it's really cool to know how to minimize all of that. So maybe check out how what different types of fonts we have, which websites uh, support which types of fonts and so on. But it's still green, which means it should be pretty simple. But here we have, as I promised, <laughs> uh, more red stuff, which is server-side rendering. Server-side rendering is very good for SEO. So imagine you're some kind of a business or a company such as Wall Street Journal, and you decide to use one of the frameworks such as React or Vue.js on uh, your website. Wall Street Journal probably needs a very good SEO but modern frameworks, even if Google promises that it parses JavaScript very well for SEO purposes, they're still behind normal server-side rendered websites. Their score is lower. That's why people came up with server-side rendered frameworks. So Next.js, Universal for Angular, and Nux.js for, I think it's mostly used with Vue.js. So you could probably also check these out, some advanced topics. Next, we have a build tools. I don't think you need to learn pretty much any of these gray ones. So knowing what Webpack is and how to configure it, because Webpack pretty much comes with every framework like React and Angular out of the box. So would be probably cool to know how to modify it, but you obviously don't need to learn it from scratch. Next up, DevTools. DevTools is a, such an essential part of a web developer nowadays because in order to debug something, you have to, well, everybody relies on it. And obviously I did not put every tab of, uh, of the web tools, but the network tab is something you have to know how to use. Basically see the response, what headers you're sending to the backend, what's backend is sending back to you and so on. And in red, we have performance tab in order to monitor the performance, the memory, how much the me of memory your app is using. Do you have memory leaks maybe? So in order to know all of this, you need to be comfortable roaming around all of these tabs. Application tab also has service worker details, caching and so on. And Lighthouse will give you a score, your performance score basically, uh, which you can see and monitor and improve your website or app performance. Next, we have progressive web apps, which is actually Lighthouse is very related to. 
a lighthouse usually is good for checking the performance of progressive web apps, but it's also an advanced topic. You should probably know what service workers, service workers are and how they work, <laughs> how to use push notifications, just like on your phone, how to do this on the web, how to use websites offline, pretty cool. I know if you didn't know how to use advanced way of caching and how to make your web app installable on phones. And last but not least, we have WebAssembly. It's also red, which means I would say it's the most advanced topic from here, uh, from the list. So you can skip it. I would skip it if I were you. But if you're a real nerd and want to go deep, I would suggest just checking it out and uh, seeing what it's all about. Well, we are done with the front end part. Yoohoo! And now we go to the back end. This is gonna be interesting as well. So the first subtree in the or, or the leaf of the backend is APIs. So I would suggest knowing what a REST API is and basically the essentials, what an open API and Swagger is, how you can yeah, show the world your endpoints, what sanitizing is, how to escape characters and prevent SQL injections because it, it working with APIs, basically, basically working with on the backend requires you to have some kind of uh, security knowledge. What a middleware, what a router and controller is, and how to use Postman, because Postman is the best friend of a backend developer. You basically use Postman to send requests and so on to your backend endpoints. We also have different runtimes on the backend. Everybody uses Node.js, but there's also Deno or Dino. I would suggest just picking one and Node.js. This is a little hint. Don't spent much time on Dino. I don't think this is that popular. Node.js is pretty much everywhere. So go with this. And of course we have Node frameworks. Express, again, choose Express. Don't go deep into other ones. If you know Express, you're good to go. Everybody uses Express. But of course, if you're curious, you can still check out what the other frameworks are about. As I said, security and authentication are big topics on the web know what a JSON web token is, how cookies work, what kind of different authentication strategies we have, how you can authenticate with your Google account or Apple account and so on. Everybody has done it, I guess, <laughs> not as developers. How hashing works, what salting is, how a big crypt works. It's the most popular uh, library for encrypting or hashing uh, user passwords in, in, in the database and so on. And what course is basically everybody runs into course errors and of course would be nice to know where they come from. Next up we have databases. Again databases are pretty crucial for backend developers. You should probably know one of the relational databases such as MySQL or maybe Postgres as well. And of course, one of the non-relational databases such as MongoDB, I wouldn't go to Firebase, although it's pretty nice to know. And if you have small projects, you could also use Firebase, but in our case, I would skip it. You should also know how to work with ORMs because they are basically used by everyone. Uh, let's say you have an app which is connected to two different databases. One of them is a MySQL and another one is MongoDB. It would be pretty, pretty frustrating to type all of the queries manually. By using SQLize or Mongoose, these are libraries, or ORM libraries for Express or Node rather, you can easily connect to both of these libraries from your server application. We have again other alternatives, Doctrine, Prisma, but don't go that far. Then we have some database concepts that are a bit advanced. They are in yellow, but still very important to know how uh, data replication works, how uh, to have backups, because backups are really important in the backend when dealing with databases. You don't want your data to get lost someday. That's why you need to have constant backups how normalization works, how basically to clean up your data if there are a lot of differences in the way they are stored and how to index um, your databases or rather tables, or rather columns, no, tables, to make the querying even faster. And we also have different type of database, an in-memory database, and this is red, and this is something advanced. Basically, red is, is pretty good for 
messengers and chats and this kind of stuff because it's gonna store a lot of data in memory which is much faster than storing it on the disk just like MySQL and MongoDB does. What we have next here is search our search engines. Imagine you are medium.com and you have a lot of articles. When a user searches for a specific article, you could have a lot of data to go over and Elasticsearch will let you do it much faster. So it's a pretty nice thing to know. But again, it's in red, so take your time. <laughs> There's an another alternative, solar, but I wouldn't suggest again, I would suggest skipping it. There are message brokers such as Kafka or RabbitMQ. They are basically dealing with a lot of distributed data. For streaming, for example, if you need to stream data from one source to another, pretty complex stuff. So, but I would still suggest learning them. And again, very simple, Nginx. Well, not simple, but uh, the concept is simple. It's simply a web server that can run everywhere. You can run it locally, you can run it in a Docker container, you can run it again everywhere <laughs> on your EC2 instance, for example. And it has alternatives such as Apache and Tomcat, which are still popular, but as a JavaScript web developer, Nginx is a way to go. Okay, what we have next is the DevOps branch. And DevOps has also quite interesting stuff. And we're gonna start from the very bottom. In the very bottom, in yellow, we have our cloud providers or rather cloud services, starting with AWS, the most powerful and the most popular one. It basically powers how much? 40%, 30% of the whole internet. So would be really important to know how to work in it. I'm gonna again add a really extensive course on AWS from Free Code Camp, so check it out. Google Cloud, Heroku, Azure, DigitalOcean, I would say just take a course on AWS and look into Google Cloud, maybe create an account for yourself. But to be honest, I used all of them and all of them are very nice. And different companies use different cloud providers. Not everyone, and not everybody uses AWS. So maybe you should check them out, at least create an account and uh, play around. Next up, we have log management. Logs management are pretty important, especially if you are a backend developer, because you should probably log every request that is coming in and going out in order to be able to debug stuff easily. For example, imagine that you have, you're have you working in a company and you get some kind of a complaint that the user was not able to log in or had some kind of an issue. How do you debug this? You are not the user and you were not at with the user. What you do to you is use, you use one of the logs management and you will probably be able to find the error that the user faced in the logs. For this, you can use Greylog or Elastic Stack. I personally use Greylog and I'm pretty satisfied with it. So I would suggest it too. Next up, we have application management, application monitoring. I personally have not used a Jagger but I saw that it's pretty popular among in the community. So maybe give it a try. Infrastructure monitoring, it's pretty similar to monitoring an app, but it's rather monitoring the infrastructure, basically how your instances or so to say machines operate and how much memory they use and so on. Next up, we have Terraform, which is kind of an easy way to set up your infrastructure. For example, you could either go to your AWS account and start all the machines manually, or maybe with a CLI, but with Terraform, you get a specific kind of a, a set of commands in a <laughs> nice way, just with a code. As, as soon as you push this code, it automatically spins everything up depending on what you wrote. Next up, we have container orchestration like uh, Kubernetes and a Docker Swarm and Mes Mesos, Mesos. I would suggest just looking into Kubernetes because this is the most popular one to orchestrate all the containers, Docker containers, for example, that you use and everybody uses Dockers. This is pretty extensive. That's why it's in red. Still pretty important to learn, but maybe leave it uh, for the end when you feel ready. Puppet for configuration management. It's mostly used with AWS to manage all the, the network, the VPC of your company rather than orchestration. So this is basically 
managing all the infrastructure that you have. Uh, it's again, really deep into DevOps. If I were you, I would also leave it till the end. Last but not least, we have CD and CI. These are a very important nowadays because how do you ensure that you have a continuous delivery? For example, you are working in a company and you need to ship 10 updates a day. How do you make sure that you don't break anything else? Well, you should probably have unit tests and E2E tests and integration tests set up and all of them will run in a sequence with the help of GitHub Actions in an automated way. Check up GitHub Actions. There are also alternatives such as, such as GitLab CI, Circle CI, Jenkins, but everybody uses GitHub, so go with GitHub for now. Next up, what we have is service management and process monitoring. Let's say you are using Nginx and you want to stop and start Nginx as a service. You should ideally know how to do that in the console or in the terminal. So make sure you know how service management works and how process monitoring works pretty much in your terminal. Going to the miscellaneous section, we will skip extra for now. And we're going to start from the very top. So operating system, you should ideally know how to use terminal, obviously, and what kind of terminal commands are uh, we have, for example, grep, ls, and so on, just the basics, what the file system looks like if you are using Ubuntu, or if you are using a Mac or Windows, Ubuntu, uh, well, Linux and Mac has a similar file system, Windows has a different one, so you should get, be familiar with them and also see how process management works because it's gonna help you to find issues very fast when one of your applications is down and you don't know why it happened, you can uh, start or start and stop those processes. Version control, very important. Git is such an essential for a developer, any developer actually, you don't have to be a web developer. That's why it's in miscellaneous. You should also know what pull requests are if you are working in a team, somebody will do a code review on your pull request and merge it. Again, check the difference of pull requests in GitHub and GitLab. In GitLab, those are called merge requests, but they are pretty much the same thing. So just log in to GitHub, maybe go to a React, <laughs> some kind of a popular repository and look into their pull requests and how they communicate there. Next up, we have a Docker which is an absolute essential nowadays. Again, this could be a bit difficult for beginners to grasp the idea of how a Docker works because it's basically a machine on top of a machine. And I totally understand, even if I put it in green, I think it's an absolute essential and you cannot proceed without it because you're gonna come across it later or sooner, sooner or later. <laughs> not later or sooner. Next up, we have a testing. Testing is pretty much to ensure that your app does not break at some point. And we have different types of testing. Unit tests are done to test a particular pieces of code, maybe functions, maybe a specific action in your code. For this, you can use Jest, uh, which is built into React or Jasmine, which is built into Angular, and you can use them as standalone test unit testing libraries. You can also use Cypress for E2E testes, tests, which is an end-to-end -end test. For example, I guess Amazon uses an end-to-end -end test to, to, to replicate a user purchase. A user clicks on an item, goes to the shopping cart and uh, makes a payment and so on. E2E tests run every time somebody pushes a new change <clears throat> to make sure that the user journey did not break. There are again alternatives, but knowing just Cypress will teach you how uh, what an E2E test is in general. We also have other ways to test APIs. So if you're a backend developer, you should probably know SuperTest. I uh, like SuperTest, that's why I highlighted it. But people also use Frisbee and Chakram. I haven't used them. Uh, super test was good enough for me. Uh, basically, you will be able to uh, define a kind of response that it should come back from your API and test against it. Next up, we have linting. Linting is very important because by working in a team, 
you want to make sure that everybody has more or less the same coding style and this will help you to achieve it even if it's never gonna be perfect. Sometimes you can use ESLint, TSLint and Prettier <laughs> all at the same time even though it's not recommended. Prettier, you can use TSLint and Prettier or ESLint and Prettier, but linting is basically something that is gonna help you with your coding style and it can perform checks in the CI CD when you're using GitLab or a GitHub. So basically you can do checks like, is there maybe an extra white space in the code? If yes, then a pipeline fails and the code does not proceed. We also have error tracking is it's kind of similar to what we just had in the backend with logging, but this is for the front end. Well, Sentry is for backend and front end both. I'm lying. I'm sorry, but Sentry is super extensive. You can also have, for example, if a user gets an error on your front end in the console log, obviously you are not with that user and you don't see their console log. Sentry will capture it and show it to you. So it's pretty cool to debug and know what your clients are facing. Next up, we have GraphQL. I included GraphQL obviously because it's so famous coming from Facebook. There are a GraphQL uh, libraries such as Relay or Apollo and they are in yellow. So you need to know what, the, what GraphQL is. Take a course. I will again link in the description. Please check it and maybe choose Relay. They, they should be pretty similar. So just choose one of them, I would say. Again, next we have uh, WebSockets, which enables us to have real-time communication with the, between the client and server. Imagine you are some kind of a broker website, a Robinhood, and uh, you need the data to be updated every second. How would you make requests to the server every second to find what stock price is? I would say no. <laughs> That's why you would probably initialize WebSocket connection to pull this data or to pull this data every second automatically without establishing new connection every second or every time. Next up, we have static site generators. And this is already in red because this is something extra, probably good for freelancers. If you're a full-time employee in, in some kind of company, I would say this is not, a, not a, such a popular option. But static uh, site generators are such a concept that you build a website and you're you connect it to a database and every time you build it, it pulls the data from your database and kind of hard codes it into your build. And then it's also pretty good for CEO. So definitely check out uh, static site generators. Next up, we have headless CMS, which again goes hand in hand with static site generators because you kind of want to control what's on the backend. Basically, you can write art articles on a backend and Gatsby is gonna pull those articles. And the way, basically the way WordPress works, I, I, I put WordPress here. So if you know WordPress, it's gonna be kind of similar, but now, well, WordPress is not dead, but uh, Prismic, Sanity, IO are, more popular ways to to do the same uh, job in a you know kind of a neat way next up we have uh, design patterns this is something again coming from uh, computer science will really help you with frameworks because uh, basically singleton facade observer you're, you're going to come across these concepts as soon as you use maybe express.js and so on so really important to know how what of, of these design patterns are. Then we have some coding principles such as KISS, DRY, YAGNI, KISS, like basically don't repeat yourself uh, and so on, uh, basically to ensure that you are not writing spaghetti code and your code is consistent. Uh, just check them out, they are all in green. <clears throat> and we have also web performance. Uh, find, uh, ch check out the rail model, uh, what the rail model is, it's coming from Google, basically, can ensure some kind of uh, performance standard. Check out the critical rendering path, how to make your website load even faster and what a pixel pipeline is because this is like the really pro level things for optimizing your website. And if you want to be hired in a really good company, they usually check for this kind of knowledge. Last but not least, we have some extra stuff that I added here. Of course, they are all gonna be in red because they are 
really extra and you really don't have to know these unless you are just a nerd <laughs> or curious. But even anyway, if you want to get into mobile development, you could check out React Native because it's basically React, even though it's very different from React, but it's still JavaScript. And by knowing React Native, you will be able to build mobile applications by using your web development skills. Flutter is using Dart, so I wouldn't really recommend it. And I used it and I didn't like it. Some people like it, but it's a completely different language and uh, React Native is something that is closer to us web developers. If you wanna build desktop applications, definitely check out Electron, Spotify, as far as I know, and VS Code, like a lot of applications on the front end are, uh, sorry, on the desktop are built using Electron. So definitely a cool thing to check out. If you are into IoT, if you have a Raspberry Pi and you wanna do some projects, definitely check out Node Red. You can uh, do IoT and hardware uh, engineering using a JavaScript or Node. And of course, if you're into deep learning, machine learning, definitely check out TensorFlow.js. Nowadays, you can do machine learning on the browser, which is super cool. Also check out Face API JS. I used it a couple of times. Uh, Face API JS is a library that already includes a lot of models for doing everything with uh, face, face detection, pose estimation, and, and a lot of cool stuff. If you still have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them. Also, if you think that I missed something or you have something to add to the list, feel free to share it with everyone because I think it will definitely help other learners. Have a nice rest of the day and goodbye.